All right, so we're going to get started, and if you wouldn't mind putting away your phones, that would be awesome, so that we can have your full undivided attention. So here's a picture of myself and my siblings circa 1992. Um, I recognize anything in the look before the 2000s is like dinosaur age, maybe. Um, but the 90s is the decade I grew up in. And here I am squeezing my little brother Josh, um, much to his dismay. I was five years old the year he was born in 1992. So I think I was old enough, if any of you are older siblings, um, when you're kind of that age, you're old enough to really think you can help take care of this person. And so that's how I felt. I remember feeling that way, even at that age. Now, you might be wondering why am I showing you pictures of myself and my siblings when we were little. Um, so about 17 years after these pictures were taken, um, my brother Josh would have taken his life. These are pictures of Josh shortly before he took his life. Um, he was a junior at South Lakes High School. So here in Fairfax County, I graduated from Langley High School. My other two siblings graduated from TJ. Um, he played high school football and lacrosse. He was loved um, and supported by many. He had lots of friends. Um, had a girlfriend. He was kind of your typical teenage high school kid, if there's such a thing. So what do we know about suicide? Suicide is the second leading cause of death for adolescents in the US. Three in every, three of 10 high school students in the US feel hopeless or sad for two or more weeks such that they stop doing some type of usual activity. In other words, suffer from depression. So how many students do we think are here, actually? So if we sort of apply this for every 100 students, 30 are actually suffering from depression, statistically speaking. So just look around, and that's, that's a big number. And that's why this week and our mental health is so important. So 80% of teens with depression typically don't seek the help they need. We also know that 80% of those treated for depression actually start to feel better. So why do we think that is? Actually, let's open that up. You can just raise your hand or shout out. Why do you think that teens don't seek the help they need when we actually know that seeking treatment and help helps us feel better? They might be embarrassed. They might be embarrassed. Thank you. Some parents don't believe that depression is real, so there's pushbacks and obstacles there. Anyone else? They're scared. They're scared? Yeah, so these are all, these are exactly what I was going to say. I was going to say is it's because of the shame, the stigma, the embarrassment, maybe the lack of resources, not knowing where to turn, not wanting to burden other people. So depression and other mental health disorders affect the brain. Here we have a slide of the brain and all of the brain's functions. Who here is a science person? Raise your hand. <laughs> Maybe we have a lot of English people in the room. Um, so what do we know about the brain though? The brain is probably, if not the most important organ of the body, affecting basically all of our functions. So if we have anyone up here, who can read any of uh, the functions of the brain? Yes, okay, so basically everything that we do 
So if we have an illness that affects this organ, don't you think it's gonna affect a lot of our functioning? Yeah. So the problem is we can't see it. We have the ability to see more clearly other diseases and physical issues. So here on the left, what do you think this is a picture of? Broken ankle, sprained ankle. Who here sprained their ankle? Lots of hands. What happens? It swells up like a balloon, right? Then you have a, maybe a bruise that lasts for a while. I know, I played basketball even, I know, that's surprising. I played basketball in high school. And yeah, it's surprising, right? I was a little shooting guard. So, and I had to wear a brace because it was kind of a precautionary thing for me. So I sprained my ankle a lot of times. Swollen, you could see it, right? You could see a bruise. Um, we have the ability to test cells to see if they're cancerous. So what do you think the picture on the right is? Cancer, so ability to locate tumors by a scan to actually see where the disease is. But we don't have this same ability for diseases of the brain in terms of mental health. So for depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and other mood disorders, we don't have a physical way of seeing the disease. Instead, it comes out in our thinking, in our way of feeling, in our way of acting, or not acting? Is this why then there is such stigma around with suffering from a mental or emotional disorder? So by raise of hands, who here has ever told their friends or maybe teachers that they had to leave school or class early to go to a doctor's appointment? Just raise your hand if you've ever shared with anyone else, oh, I gotta go, I, I, I won't miss practice, I'm gonna miss that class. Okay, so we have a good amount of hands. Now, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, but if you maybe had a therapy appointment or an appointment to see a psychiatrist, I might ask who here has actually shared with their friends, their teacher, openly, oh, I have to leave earlier, I'm gonna miss practice because of my therapy appointment, because of my psychiatrist appointment. Maybe not a lot, so we don't, we don't need to share, but, but maybe less, right? Maybe less. So why is it do we lie and cover up when we're actually seeking help for an illness and disorder of the brain? that same organ that's so important to all of our functioning. So, in doing this work for some time now, not only do I try to talk the talk, but I try to walk the walk. So here's an actual text conversation with myself, I'm there on the blue, right? We all know that iPhone messaging comes through. And this is with one of my friends. And here he is asking me, how are you feeling? How's your day going? Having just left therapy, I responded, feeling all right. Wednesday is normally therapy day, but I had it today. So I'm out tomorrow, so just leaving now, and now I'm gonna treat myself to some Chick-fil-A. So basically, one text message, I'm destigmatizing mental health and celebrating my self-care. Kudos to me, pat on the back. No, but it's just a simple way to, to, how can we start to normalize this conversation so that it's not stigmatized, right? And that's just an easy way to do that. So if we had a test to show us something on the brain that signified it wasn't operating optimally, would that make a difference? So going back to that picture of, um, that's locating cancerous tumors, what if there was a way to physically show that our brain wasn't operating optimally? That telling us that it's not our fault, that it's actually a chemical imbalance or something else affecting our cognitive functioning, our emotional processing, um, our ability to process. 
In a very literal way, we show support when we can see the disability, the hurt, or the impairment. Does anyone here have a current cast off? I guess it's more common like in elementary school age, right? But when we can't point to something else that's impacting our ability to function at our best, we blame ourselves. Why can't I concentrate harder? Why do I feel like this? Why can't I just be normal like everyone else? And after a while, we might start saying to ourselves, I don't deserve to live. This world would, might be better off without me. Nobody understands me, therefore I don't have a place in this world. But what if we changed around the narrative that having depression or anxiety is just like having a broken arm? So just in the way that we support someone that has a cast, signing their cast, it's a fun activity, right? You're not embarrassed that you broke your arm, you might have fallen off the monkey bars. That having depression or anxiety is just like that, and we should support it as such. That it's not our fault. We are not alone. It's something that we can get help for and start to heal and get better. So going back to that statistic, 80% of people who seek treatment for depression start to feel better within the first two weeks. So why, then, are 80% of teens with depression not seeking help? We need to change this. Let's start to treat mental health disorders as we would other physical illness. Just as a cast helps a broken arm, insulin helps regulate diabetes, mental health treatment such as therapy, maybe medication, helps depression and other mood disorders. Let's not overcomplicate it. Let's not pass judgment. Just like you go to the doctor when you don't feel well physically, you might go to see a mental health professional if you're feeling not quite yourself mentally. Maybe feeling anxious that's not just normal school stress, so it kind of goes on for longer periods and you can't really point it to any certain thing having a lack of interest or energy to do things that you used to love. All of these things and more can maybe suggest that it's time to seek help from a mental health professional. Let's start to create a new narrative around mental health. It can start with you. So what else can we do to buffer and support our mental health? Who here likes to get this message on their phone? No one, right? What about this message? One percent, the one percent. What type of panic do you start to feel in your body when you get down to one percent? Okay. We've all been there, we've all been there, we get it, we've all been there, we've all been there. But, we're so aware of the charge of our phone. Probably without knowing and looking at your phone, you might even be able to recall right at this moment about what charge you're at, right? About what time you need to plug your phone in because we need it charged in order to use it. We're so reliant on our phones. Therefore, we know when we're low in a charge, we know when we have to plug in. In the same way, we need to think of our ourselves like phones. We need to be charged up in order to operate optimally. But a lot of the time, we're so depleted we're trying to operate at 1% charge. Who here can relate with this image? They've had to apologize later for something they did when they were hangry. Right? I'm the same way. Hangry is not a good look for me. 
Um, so in the same way, right? So when we're when we're hungry, when we haven't eaten in a while, that's like we're we're getting down to ten percent, eight percent. You know, we're we're not operating from our best. So not only. Not only do we need to make sure we have eaten well and consistently, that we're sleeping well, right? That maybe we're exercising, but also proactively engaging in things that can continue to charge up our batteries. For me, that's yoga, preferably with a dog. But for you, it might be writing, reading, being outside, playing sports, playing an instrument drawing, coloring, listening to music, hanging out with friends, medit meditating, praying, hanging out with family, anything that helps you feel more charged in a positive way. That like after that activity, you actually feel like, oh, I have a lot, I have a lot more capacity now. I'm ready, I'm ready to take on life in a, in a bigger way. So finally, what else can help buffer and help our mental health? Social connection. What your classmates in the Jaguar Minds Matter Club have been doing this week is awesome. Connecting students in a positive way, stress-free way has been awesome. Who here has taken part in some activities this week that the Jaguar Minds Matter Club has been putting on? Yeah, or at least you've been seeing it, right? We're social beings, whether we like it or not. And we need one another in order to survive, to survive in this world. A Stanford study showed that lack of social connection was a greater detriment to our health than obesity, than smoking, and high blood pressure. Just think about that statement. Not having social connection is just as harmful to your health and your longevity as is smoking. Worried you don't have tons of friends or are an introvert? It's actually not the amount of friends that you have um, or even the amount of time that you spend with friends but it's that internal subjective feeling of connection. So this can come, who's your dog person? Clearly I am. Okay, so just that feeling you, you get when you pet a dog. We're, we're gonna have some therapy dogs later, today? Today, where? Right outside of the cafeteria, come by, get your dose of connection. But that feeling when you pet a dog and you see that dog smile and the tongue hanging out that goofy way and you kind of feel just a little bit nice inside, that's that feeling of internal subjective connection. Similarly, when you open the door for someone and they give you a genuine smile, that's that sense of internal connection. Another way you can do this, random acts of kindness. The more we can be kind to one another and support one another, the better we all will be. Remember, be kind, for everyone you know is fighting a battle. So in sum, let's increase awareness about mental health and talk about it the same way we do physical health. Let's increase our self-care and find things that charge our batteries. And let's promote connectedness and support one another. So these are the three pillars of the Minds Matter movement that the Jaguar Minds Matter Club is a part of. And they're doing great things within your school. But all of these things are things that you individually can come away from the justice presentation and make a difference in your life. I'll end with one of my favorite quotes by Mary Oliver. <clears throat> Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? All the power is yours. Make a decision now to make a difference in your life and the lives of others.
going forward. So again, thank you for being here. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your life.